Good morning, and can I welcome everyone to the sixth meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018. Can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is the decision on whether to take agenda items three and four in private. Is everyone content that agenda items three and four are taken in private? Thank you. Uh, the next item of business is an evidence session with the Commissioner for Fair Access. The committee is keeping a watching brief on work towards widening access following the government's endorsement of the Commission's work. The committee heard from the Commissioner when he was very new in his post last year, and this session will be an update with the Commissioner on his work over the past year and planned work. It will also be useful context for the evidence session with the Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science, who is giving evidence to the committee primarily on widening access on the 7th of March. And on that note, can I welcome to the committee Sir Professor Peter Scott, the Commissioner for Fair Access. And here in a support capacity is Lynn McMillan, Strategic Lead Access to Higher Education, Scottish Government. Sir Professor Scott, I understand you will make a short opening statement. Well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to meet the committee today. Um, uh, I will keep my opening statement very brief because I've submitted a written statement. Um, uh, so I'll just emphasize one or two key issues within it. Um, some of the issues I do raise are ones that are potentially raise, will be raised by you, I'm sure, in questions. Um, so I'll refer to them very briefly. Um, I think I'd like to start by emphasizing how successful Scotland has been in terms of higher education. Um, it has the highest rate of participation in the, in the UK, 56% um, uh, as opposed to 49% in England. Um, uh, and generally, I think there's very little to apologize for in terms of the commitment that Scotland has made to uh, its colleges and universities. Um, of course, there is always more to be done, uh, and I've tried to summarise um, uh, the comments I made in my annual report. Um, so I won't go over them in great detail. Um, uh, I see in the briefing document uh, one of the concerns expressed potentially is that I've made rather too many recommendations, uh, and I'm very happy to deal with that uh, um, if I'm asked that question. Um, my overall assessment of progress is that uh, progress has been steady um, uh, across the higher education sector as a whole. I think it's been impressive. Um, obviously, some institutions have been much more committed um, to achieving fair access, largely for objective, I think, rather than reasons of choice. Um, uh, and it's important, I think, that all institutions make uh, uh, a substantial commitment to the fair access agenda. Um, having said that, I think it's wrong to focus so strongly on the role of the ancient universities that the very important contribution made by the colleges um, is somehow downgraded. Um, most of the matters I cover in my annual report are issues that were raised with me in discussions uh, uh, with uh, people in institutions and other agencies. Um, uh, and cover a fairly familiar list, um, admissions and progression, particularly contextual admissions and making adjusted offers to students from more deprived backgrounds, articulation particularly, uh, and this is one area where I think I've potentially been a little bit more critical, uh, the uh, record of college students with higher nationals uh, not being, I think, given sufficient academic credit if they transfer to degree programs. Um, uh, in addition to my annual report, um, I published uh, four discussion documents which were available on uh, the website, and I've given references to those. Um, uh, I particularly highlight, I think, the last of those, which was published just last month on retention outcomes and destination, because I think it does actually bring new data uh, into uh, the debate, uh, or certainly data in a more accessible way. Um, and the only other final things I'd like to mention are that um, uh, the issue of my independence, I think, came up last time, and I'm sure will come up this time. I've given a brief summary in my written evidence of how I feel about that, uh, but again, I'm very happy to be questioned about it. And the second concern, I think, expressed a year ago when I appeared before the committee uh, was the uh, question of a budget um, uh, and other forms of support. Um, 
Uh, and again, I'm very happy to answer questions on those as well. Um, uh, in conclusion, I think I would just like to thank everyone who's supported me uh, in my work as Commissioner for Fair Access. Um, uh, as I say in my written statement, it's been a privilege to be given an opportunity to make a contribution uh, to a cause which I very strongly believe in and always have been strongly committed to. Um, uh, and I think at that I, I will uh, stop and uh, listen to your questions and try thank, to answer them. Thank you, Professor Scott. I'll now open questions to the other members and I'll start with my Vice Convener, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for coming along today and, and for providing a very interesting, I think, um, written report and your, and your statement just now. I want to ask you about um, the series of recommendations. You make me clearly the original report on, on widening access produced a series of, of recommendations. In your first year, you have then produced a further 24, I think, 22. And I found them very interesting reading, and I'll maybe highlight a couple of them in a moment. But I wonder what is the, the standing of these recommendations? Where are they now? Who is responsible for implementing them? And how will you measure progress in terms of implementing these recommendations? Um. Uh, well, I did make 23 recommendations, uh, and I know that in the evidence submitted by University of Scotland, um, uh, they uh, felt that perhaps that was rather too many, um, in addition to the recommendations made by the Commission. Um, and, of course, University of Scotland itself uh, uh, had, uh, has undertaken work in this area and produced recommendations for themselves. Uh, so I think they perhaps feel that they're rather uh, being weighed down under the load of recommendations. Um, uh, I had a meeting with the University of Scotland two weeks ago, uh, and I tried then to explain what I saw as the status of many of my recommendations. Um, uh, most actually are in areas which are already very familiar and covered by other recommendations. So they're really um, uh, variations on recommendations that have already been made, um, in many cases, I think, urging rather faster progress. Um, uh, other recommendations, I think, are more in the nature of suggested topics for discussion, issues which I feel should be debated more widely in the sector. Uh, for example, uh, I raise a potentially controversial recommendation about whether we need to look more carefully at measures of success uh, and whether the current measures of success we have are uh, focused very much on the experience of traditional students um, uh, and therefore may not always be sufficiently sensitive or flexible when it comes to students from different backgrounds. Um, but that's a, an issue, for exa an example of something which I think is an issue for debate, really. Um, it's not a recommendation I would uh, expect anyone to be able to implement um, uh, in the short or even the medium term. Um, uh, so most of my recommendations, I think, either cover very familiar territory uh, and really just try and advance um, recommendations that have already been made by the Commission or by University of Scotland themselves, or secondly, are matters for um, which I would like to see a wider debate within the sector about. Um, there are, of course, one or two recommendations I make um, which are potentially more uh, challenging. I think uh, one is potentially more challenging to the government itself uh, when I ask them to uh, suggest they should review the total number of funded places available. Uh, and I hope at some point there might be some response from the government to that. I wonder if we could expect more than hope that sometime we might get a response. I think it would be helpful if there was an expectation in government to respond. I noticed that particular recommendation, I think, in the context of the debate we're now having across the United Kingdom about funding um, students, the idea of a cap and implications of a cap um, on Scottish... Uh, domicile students. I mean, I've been told it's more difficult for a Scottish domicile student to get into university now than at any time in the last 10 years. I don't know if it's true, but it'd be useful to find out. I mean, do you, well, do you have, would it be reasonable for you to, I think, or would we encourage you to expect government to respond to that particular recommendation? If I might ask you maybe to reflect also on your last recommendation, which I thought was very interesting, which was that we shouldn't just be looking at um, widening access specifically to what happens to somebody when they're 17, but somebody who's been denied the opportunity when they're 17 may want to go when they're 25, when they're 30, and I wonder how you think that should be taken forward. Um, well, on the first one, I mean, there's obviously been quite an important debate about the issue of displacement, about whether in a capped system 
if you recruit more students from disadvantaged backgrounds, other students um, may potentially lose out, uh, be squeezed out by that. Um, uh, the evidence, I think, is so far is uh, relatively unclear about whether that's happening on any significant scale. Um, but nevertheless, that is a strong perception um, uh, and therefore is an important issue. Um, and, and clearly it would help if there were uh, slightly more flexibility in terms of the funded places available that would address some of those fears about displacement. Um, uh, and I did say in that recommendations there are opportunities available um, to increase the number of funded places uh, without necessarily increasing uh, the budget for higher education. Although, of course, as someone who comes from higher education, I would be in favour of that as well. Um, uh, uh, sadly, one of the effects of Brexit, um, if it happens, uh, will be that European Union students, from, except from the rest of the UK, uh, would no longer be within the cap number. Um, and that's currently a total of almost 4,000 students. Um, so a significant number. Um, if you compare that with the number of students that would be required to meet the targets in 2021 or even 2026, the numbers would be significantly less than the number of, inter of, of, of other EU students. Um, I also think there are opportunities to, for, to make savings in terms of uh, what I call smarter articulation, giving HN students um, more credit um, if they transfer to degree programmes. Um, uh, there are other reasons why that's desirable, but one of the effects, of course, would be that he would actually release more funded places. Um, so I, 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 in my recommendation, hope the government will look carefully at how these opportunities might be uh, um, uh, seized upon. Um, and if there is an opportunity to increase funded places, the total number, um, without a significant increase in the higher education budget, um, uh, that would clearly address f fears of, of displacement. It would also, I think, give institutions the headroom to recruit more students uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds. So I do think that's an important recommendation. So I do accept it's a difficult one for the government, and there will always be competing pressures for public spending. Um, uh, the second point that you would raised um, about older students and students with other forms of disadvantage, um, I did deliberately include a recommendation in my report because I think there's, again, a widespread perception, or I think it's a mistaken one, that the targets are only focused on young adults. Um, and in fact, if we read the Commission's report and the way the government has expressed the targets, that appears not to be the case. They're talking about students of all ages, although they are initial entrants to higher education. Um, uh, so I did think it important, really, to emphasise the needs of adult returners um, should be given equal weight. Just can I ask then, what is your expectation in terms of timetable responding to these recommendations? And we wouldn't want to come back in a year's time, God willing, and find out that actually we're still hoping for a response. And I suppose the last thing I want to ask is just about the coming year. I'm very interested in what you say about articulation, because I know that you know from the colleges that I've spoken to, there is an issue about valuing you know, some of the, the, the college courses. Would you look at articulation from what is now a very substantial work that's done in S6 in comparison when I was teaching and a lot of young people who maybe do a huge amount of work in sixth year, which is really replicated in, in first year at university, and is there a place to do that kind of work too? Do you see that as part of your role? Just simply in terms of freeing up the system a bit um, around opening up opportunities for students? Yes. Um, well, on the first point, on, the, on when the government will respond, um, there is a meeting next week of the uh, uh, Fair Access Delivery Group, um, which is chaired by the Minister, which I attend. Um, and I've been told that after that meeting, there will be some kind of response by the government. Uh, I have no idea how much detail the government will go into or whether it will respond to all the recommendations I make. Um, but I am confident there will be a fairly prompt reply by the government. Um, uh, Pub that response be made public? Uh, I, as far as I understand, yes. I mean, uh, uh, that's my yes, that's my understanding. It would be. I think it would be in the form of a ministerial statement. So I think it would be made public. Yes. Um, on the second point on articulation, um, 
That is an important issue, and one of the uh, areas in which I push a bit harder, I think, than uh, University of Scotland might itself care to go, um, uh, is that I do think it's important that there should be precise targets for articulation, uh, and I do think that the, uh, of students who are doing HNs who transfer to degree programs, uh, and I do think the default position, the starting position, is that they should be given full credit. This is, after all, a two-year higher education qualification. Uh, so logically, they should enter into year three of a degree program. Um, I know there will be reasons why that's not always appropriate, particularly if they're changing their, their subject significantly and so on. Um, but I also include under the head of articulation um, the interface between uh, the final year in secondary, S6, and the first year in undergraduate. Um, because I think there probably is a significant overlap in some areas. Um, uh, and although I would defend very strongly the principle of a four-year undergraduate degree, which after all is the international global standard, um, it's England that's out of step there, um, I would defend the four-year degree. I, I do think that better use could often be made of the first year of undergraduate education. Um, perhaps there should even be some co-teaching back into the S6. I don't know. I mean, I just think this is an area that should be considered... Um, I know that the government has the Learner Journey Initiative, um, which is looking at that issue, among others. Um, uh, but again, I think um, that would help um, to produce a better kind of transition. Um, I'm very conscious that in some countries, particularly the United States, a lot of attention is focused on the first year experience in university. Um, and here in Scotland, and more generally in the UK, there's not the same emphasis on that. I was going to ask you questions around about that first year experience, I believe, but uh, that's pointless. Uh, Convener, I wonder, uh, Professor Scott, if we could turn attention to the relevant data. Um, you mentioned when you came uh, last year that there are issues about uh, whether we have the right data in front of us. And when we had a, an evidence session with uh, Petra Vend, with Susan Stewart and with Sally Mapstone, it was quite a, a big issue there. Uh, and I note in the University of Scotland uh, paper for this meeting that there is concern that we don't necessarily have um, the most relevant and effective data in front of us, and therefore that makes obviously policy decisions really quite difficult. Could you um, tell the committee whether you feel that there has been progress in identifying uh, that data or whether we need to do a lot more to provide it? Well, I think there's always a need to do more work, but I know a group has been, a technical group has been looking at improving the data, um, and they have a, a meeting uh, next week. Um, uh, I think Professor Went particularly referred to the unique learner number, um, and, and clearly that would help. Uh, uh, um, I think there are many different measures of disadvantage, um, and the more accurate fix you can get on it, the better. Um, Having said that, I know there's a lively debate about whether uh, the current dominant measure, not the only measure, but the current dominant measure, SIMD, uh, is the uh, best marker of deprivation. Um, in my report, I think you'll see that I, on the whole, defend it. Um, uh, first of all, um, although it's an area-based metric, um, it's quite a fine grain one, um, uh, certainly compared to POLA, which is the UK-wide system, which covers larger populations. Um, uh, and secondly, I think the intention is to kind of try and focus on deeply entrenched kind of community-based forms of deprivation, which is reproduced generation by generation. Um, and if that is your primary focus, I think SIMD is probably quite a good measure. Uh, but of course, other measures should be used. Um, uh, I answered an earlier question about adult students. I've always I felt very strongly that um, that uh, adult returners and adult learners um, uh, are probably to some extent disadvantaged by our current higher education system. Um, so I think that should be the case. Um, but I think we should be aware of a, a proliferation of markers of disadvantage. Um, uh, I think I was told uh, by both St Andrews and Edinburgh that up to half of their new entrants, um, Scottish entrants, uh, had at least one mark of disadvantage. I mean, uh, now I think that's rather too many. I think that rather diffuses the whole thing. I think we want to keep the focus relatively tight on deprivation. Yeah, I understand that point, um, Professor Scott. I think, however, if if the the real focus has to be on schools um, to ensure that um, we 
make things better for colleges and universities. Um, there, there's a very strong argument, in fact, that it, it's schools that matter most in this. And therefore, to pick up the, um, the students in schools who are most likely to be in need of help, SIMD does have its failings in, in that respect, because obviously it's a neighbourhood measure and there are children within that who will do a lot better, but there are obviously uh, children in, in non SIMD 20 who will have difficulty too. I, I think the point that some of your colleagues are making is that we're not quite clear about the, um, the relevance of some of the data set that we need. University of Scotland make this point very strongly in their paper. And I just wonder if you have any ideas about what we can do just to improve our knowledge of who is most in need of help and therefore where the policy could be directed. And that's very much a school's policy. Mm, yes. Um, well, a lot of the data we have, um, there's often a trade-off between its relevance and its accuracy. Um, uh, I'm clear there are some unambiguous um, uh, indicators. I mean, uh, eligibility for free school meals and so on. Um, and I think those are widely used by all institutions. Um, uh, I think uh, coming from a school that has a poor record of sending people onto higher education might well be another indicator. Although, again, it's a group indicator rather than an individually focused indicator. Um, there was some excellent research commissioned by the uh, Funding Council specifically on the issue of contextual admissions, where there was a very good description of precisely this, the most reliable forms of data um, and the most relevant forms of data, and trying to get the balance right. Um, I think there continues to, there has to continue to be an important debate about this, and uh, I think we uh, do need to focus as much as possible on improving our data. Um, having said that, and I hope this will be misinterpreted, um, I think, in a way, a lot of the evidence and data is available. We sort of know what the problem is. I mean, the issue is whether we have the will and the resources to address the problems. Um, with respect, I don't think that's quite the argument that University of Scotland is making, that, that they're arguing that they don't actually have some of the data that they believe they need to pass on to their institutions. Um, so, sorry. sorry. I, I was just going to ask, in, in the context of your huge experience uh, with the sector, and obviously your knowledge of um, in the international um, aspects on higher education. Do, do you feel that there is information or data that they use that might be helpful in Scotland to progress the policy? Well, I mean, uh, the absence of a unique learner number, I mean, is an issue, uh, and I think that can and should be remedied. Um, I think one of the other uh, forms of data that the University of Scotland is particularly concerned about is uh, individual attainment levels. Um, uh, and uh, I realise that that can't always be available in as complete a form um, as uh, they would necessarily like. Having said that, I think occasionally the absence of data is, is, can be used as a, um, uh, a kind of blanket excuse. Um, for example, I think University of Scotland, in discussing the issue of setting minimum entry standards, uh, say that they, um, it would be helpful to have more data, for example, on individual attainment levels. Um, uh, I don't completely accept that because setting the minimum entry standard is really an academic issue. It's about the knowledge and skills that a student needs. Um, now, I agree, then they need to go to the next stage and try to map whether an individual applicant has those, that knowledge and skills, but setting the, the entry minimum standard, the minimum entry standard itself, uh, I don't think necessarily requires detailed knowledge of individual attainment levels by applicants. Okay, my final point would be on that. I think they feel that when it comes to thresholds, they have mm. more relevant information there, but. Uh, not uh, on, on when it comes to minimum entry requirements, because that, that's a different point. Mm. Uh, and I think if we are going to resolve matters, then we would have to have good data for both, mm. Mm. If, that, uh, if you would agree with that. Yes, I mean, I, I mean one, one can never have enough data. I mean, that's, I think, clear. Yes. I'm not sure I completely agree with that, uh, from, from the committee's viewpoint. Tavish? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have to confess, to Peter, I'm a bit confused by, by all this from Liz, Liz's line of questioning because ultimately, as you say, an individual university chooses pupil, uh, uh, student by student who they're going to accept. So, but if their criteria 
is the the SIM20 analysis, then the, the two don't compute, do they? Um, well, I think universities in making offers have always taken other factors into account, um, apart from the actual formal attainment level achieved by that individual applicant. Um, they've often looked at the, the school the applicant has come from. They've looked at other kind of data or information about that applicant. Um, for example, um, UCAS applicants make personal statements um, and universities attach some weight to that. Um, interesting enough, some recent research by the Sutton Trust on the UK basis uh, showed that personal statements, if anything, worked against access because the people who were best able to write yeah. a convincing yeah. uh, personal statement probably uh, were the students or applicants who already had a good deal of support. Um, so universities have always, in a sense, had to balance the formal criteria, um, the attainment level of the individual pupil against these wider kind of surrounding factors. Um, so I don't think the task that universities are being asked to undertake now is a new one. It's perhaps just taking other kind of hinterland information, I can put it like that, uh, yeah, rather than the ones they've traditionally mm -hmm. taken. And, and therefore, is in your research over the last year or so in Scotland, um, have you found that universities are just taking a different approach, university to university, in how they do exactly what you've just described, make an individual assessment of a student's ability to, to uh, uh, join that particular faculty? Yeah. Well, I mean, all, all universities in Scotland um, clearly take contextual uh, it, data into account in making individual offers. Um, uh, they tend to have their own customised systems. Um, Although, if you look in... Like by like, it's quite difficult in that it sense. It is. So, although, if yeah. you look in detail, actually, of course, uh, many of the indicators they use are the same. Yeah. I mean, yeah. as you would expect. Yeah. Um, uh, and one of the recommendations that University of Scotland itself has come up with is that there should be a consistent, agreed core of indicators that all universities um, uh, um, take into account. Um, and I strongly support that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think the problem, I think, as I said a year ago, is that the current system can be a, a bit opaque, a bit obscure mm. to someone who are actually applying for a place mm. or the people advising them. Um, so the greater transparency we can have, the better. Mm -hmm. Can you just set out for the committee your point about the unique learner number? I mean, again, the context of someone from five years up. Uh, what, what's the principle, what are the principal advantages of, of, of having that approach to how we ultimately make these judgments at uh, uh, application time? Well, I mean, clearly a unique learner number, you can then, of course, look at other, you can look at their individual attainment levels, yeah. you can look at their specific individual attributes, um, and so on. Um, and that does get over the kind of SIMD kind of neighbourhood yeah. problem, really, that uh, you're grouping people in a neighbourhood rather than as individuals. Um, so that would be a better system in the long um, term? I think, it, I think it would be useful alongside SIMD. Yeah. I do think, though, the, the, the primary focus on looking at community-based deprivation, which is reproduced across generations, um, is still an important principle. Yeah, yeah I think we do say that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Richard. <coughs> Thank you. I was, asked, I was going to ask something relatively similar to Tavish uh, Scott, so you've kind of covered the point, but I just want to pin down, given that the government's ambition is that by 2030, students from the 20% most deprived backgrounds should represent 20% of entrants to higher education. And the, there is a controversy over the use of the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation in Scotland because it doesn't capture rural deprivation and rural poverty. So in light of what you've just said there, do you think it's quite urgent that we review how we do capture rural deprivation in terms of your work and indeed wider work in identifying that we are taking into account uh, the needs of rural communities? Um, well, of course, the original target was set on the basis of communities. It was saying that people from the most deprived communities should have the same opportunity to enter higher education as people from the most advantaged communities. Um, so it would require, I think, the government to actually change its mind about how it defined that target. Um, and as I say in my report, and as I've said briefly now, uh, to a significant degree, I do support the idea of focusing on communities. Um, uh, 
Nevertheless, I do think it's really important when it comes to individual universities making individual offers to students, they should have as much information as possible. Um, uh, and that doesn't necessarily contradict a wider kind of obligation to kind of meet a target denominated in SIMD. Um, my hope, perhaps it's too hopeful, is that if you get it right on the first, making well-judged, very finely nuanced decisions about individual applicants in terms of disadvantage, you will also get it right on the second in terms of meeting uh, uh, targets for um, recruiting more students from more deprived backgrounds. Okay, I mean, it's quite a complex area. Uh, I guess my fundamental point is that the phrase communities has to be identified in some shape or form and it's the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation that's used generally to identify communities in deprivation, uh, albeit you're looking at different ways of measuring that. So I'm just trying to work out whether universities and higher ed education institutions will automatically focus their efforts on certain parts of Scotland because mm. of the easy way of doing that, which is through the existing index they use, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, no, no, you're sitting there, if, an, if, the, if universities are looking at a bit of a numbers game, they've got to achieve certain percentages by a certain date, mm, mm. they will focus on certain communities in Scotland, which are thrown up by the current indexes that are used across government. But if those indexes don't take into account rural poverty, then presumably their focus will be in certain parts of the country and not mm. all of the country. Mm. Um, yes, yes. I mean, obviously that's a strong argument. Um, and clearly universities sometimes complain that the current system obliges them to focus on recruiting students with a particular marker, even though a student with apparently the same degree of disadvantage who lives two streets away somehow is not so attractive to them because it doesn't help them to meet the target. Um, uh, and I suppose that uh, might happen at the margin. Um, uh, there's also the argument that because there are not enough applicants from SIMG 20 areas in the first place, that um, the, the most urgent priority is to try and expand the number of applicants, well-qualified applicants from that area. Um, and I absolutely agree with that as well. And I, the, I cover that uh, quite a lot in my report. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of the uh, work that's being undertaken by the Access Framework Development Group, um, which uh, um, is now currently at work in, um, and is going to produce a kind of toolkit um, and also try and develop a kind of community of practice, is focused on that, that particular issue itself, trying to increase the number of people from those areas who actually wish to apply to university in the first place. Um, Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I'd like to ask you about the priority given to retention. Um, University of Scotland, in their um, submission to us, have said that they believe widening access and retention should go hand in hand. Um, and the committee heard some interesting um, feedback from um, universities on our visit to the conservatoire. I was particularly struck by Glasgow Caledonian, who, um, under their corporate parenting responsibilities provide um, accommodation for care experienced young people throughout the year because obviously that's one of the things that's a that's a huge challenge so I'd just be interested to hear your reflection on that hmm. well the two do go hand in hand access and retention and not just retention but success um, uh, but as the uh, discussion document that I published about three or four weeks ago uh, shows there nevertheless is a, an attrition at every stage. I mean, uh, people from SIMD areas who are admitted um, are still more likely to not to transfer to the second year. Uh, they are rather more likely to receive an ordinary degree rather than an honours degree. Um, they're rather less likely to get a good degree, a first or two one honours. Um, uh, rather alarmingly, um, even if they do get a good degree, they are less likely to get a graduate job. So there's a very complex picture of discrimination and disadvantage at play here. Um, uh, and I do think that all needs to be taken into account in terms of access. Just getting people admitted and then leaving it, that's not enough. Um, but I do open up in my report the issue of whether we need to look more closely at how we define success. Um, for example, all universities will have 
quite strict academic regulations which determine whether you are eligible to move from year one to year two and into subsequent years. Um, uh, the Funding Council will frequently have criteria to define whether these students continue to be eligible for funding, and all this is necessary. Um, but they have always been, these criteria have been established, these regulations have been made against a background of uh, uh, um, a very unfair distribution of students. I mean, in other words, that it's made essentially with students who are well qualified, well prepared, coming on the whole from advantaged social backgrounds in mind. Um, and it mirrors their experience, their progression through. Uh, and maybe we need to actually develop a bit more flexibility. Now, this is a very tricky territory because the moment you start talking about this, people think you're conniving at dumbing down and so on. And that's the last thing I would I want to do. Um, uh, but it, I think it's a point I made a year ago. I mean, in the UK generally, um, progression rates are incredibly high compared to the United States. Um, the United States Americans generally are much more relaxed, I mean, about success. They think people, they talk about step out, they don't talk about drop out. Um, and it would be really good to be able to move to that and have more flexible systems. Um, so I think there are lots of issues that need to be addressed there. And anything we can do to free up kind of um, uh, rules about progression and so on, which give people the maximum opportunity to progress, uh, to make sure that we really do have good criteria when it comes to degree classifications that aren't in any way biased. Um, I mean, perhaps this is uh, um, slightly mischievous, but I mean, universities generally in the UK and here in Scotland have substantially increased the proportion of good degrees they offer, two ones and firsts. Now, I wonder why that's happened. I mean, we can all speculate why that might have happened. And it might have something to do with kind of competition and league tables and so on. Um, uh, but it does show that universities can be flexible in certain contexts. Well, maybe they need to be flexible in bearing in mind fair access considerations. It, it would feel, certainly feel like that's a priority because I think none of us would want to set people up to fail and, and the yeah, yeah. disadvantages that, that young people or adult returners have experienced don't just go away when they get a university place. They're, they're, they're still there, so it would certainly feel like a priority. No, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, uh, I think there's a lot of research evidence that shows on the whole that people who uh, go to university and then drop out uh, are left with a sense of failure, and often they are more disadvantaged as a result of that than they would be if they hadn't gone to university in the first place. Um, but that, I think, raises another issue about whether we have a flexible enough system. I mean, one of the recommendations I make very much as a point for discussion rather than as a kind of recommendation that needs to be implemented is that I think we should move towards a kind of more holistic tertiary view um, of a more integrated system, uh, which would allow people who perhaps had uh, dropped out at one stage to come back at another stage in a different kind of area. We, w we need a much more flexible system generally. I think that's acknowledged, it's just the difficulties of actually achieving it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Mary and then George. Thank you, um, convener, and, and good morning. I wanted to pick up on a couple of issues. One we've already discussed um, quite briefly is the contextualised admissions. Um, I also sit in the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, and you recently came to that committee, and we discussed the issue of contextualised um, admissions there. Um, and that's where grades are weighted against certain social factors to, to help to level the playing field for, for, for students. And you made three specific points in relation to contextualised admissions. And the first was um, about common agreement about the, the indicators that, that, that should be used. And you, you've touched on that briefly this morning, but I'd be grateful if you perhaps you could give a bit more detail on the progress towards that. And the second thing um, that, that you picked up on, and again, I'd be interested in your comment on progress, is the, the, the way that information is used and the clarity um, the, how, how aware students are of the weight that's put on different factors that, that, that they highlight. And the th third area you highlighted um, was a report from Durham University, and they talked about the issue of, of risk. And I particularly like the phrase you've just used, where you said step out rather than, than drop out, and it's, it's how success is measured. So I'd be grateful if you could perhaps reflect on that and tell me what progress has been made towards those things. Uh, well, on the first one, the identification of kind of core indicators that everyone would use. Um, uh, this was a recommendation made by University of Scotland themselves, uh, the uh, work group chaired by Sani Mapstone. Um, 
and that work I think is is is, is being carried forward by University of Scotland, um, uh, and I'm content that they should do so. I think really, um, I think there's general agreement on that um, uh, that we do need to focus on a certain number of core indicators that all universities would use. Um, Having said that, I think um, universities reserve the right to have their own subsidiary, secondary kind of indicators as well. Um, and provided that doesn't kind of uh, detract from the focus on the primary indicators, that's fine, because particular universities in particular regions might have particular needs, which they, uh, for instance, uh, uh, addressing more rural communities. I could see that could be a relevant indicator in one university. It wouldn't be a relevant indicator in a university in Glasgow and so on. Um, so I'm, I, I think generally I'm, 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 I'm reasonably satisfied the progress we've made on that. Um, uh, the second one I'm less clear, frankly, about um, uh, how universities intend to carry that forward. Um, and I do think it's extremely important that people have a good understanding uh, that if they do have a marker of some kind, an indicator, um, what weight is going to be attached to that? I mean, is it, does it guarantee them uh, an interview? Does it guarantee them a place? Uh, or does it simply guarantee them some rather nebulous con extra consideration? Um, uh, and I think that should be made as clear as possible. I mean, I accept there are limits to that, because after all, these are individual decisions which universities are making about individual candidates. Um, uh, uh, I mentioned personal statements earlier. I mean, universities have always taken into account individual information uh, and to generalise that and to say exactly how it's, what weight's going to be attached to it can be a bit difficult. But I think there should be a better understanding of the, the relative weight that's attached to these considerations. Um, uh, and the final issue of risk, um, uh, I think occasionally we should be prepared to take a few more risks. Um, um, I think if we only admitted students to universities when we were absolutely sure they were definitely going to succeed and getting a good degree and getting a graduate job, well, actually, we wouldn't admit that many. We would admit a lot fewer than we do currently. Um, uh, I do think opportunity uh, requires some element of risk to be accepted. Do you think on the issue of risk, I mean, when we talked about students who, who um, leave university for whatever reason sometimes feel as if they've failed, do universities have a view that the number of students that drop out are also failing? Well, I think um, there probably is a sort of uh, um, a kind of default position in um, uh, across the whole of the UK that if someone drops out, they have failed. Um, uh, uh, now, I think, again, in contrast to the United States, they would think, well, someone has achieved up to that point. Um, and they can put that in the bank and they can bring it back at some other point. Um, now, in formal terms, we have all these systems in this country of credit transfer. You can uh, often transfer your credit and bring it back at some later stage. But in practice, it happens a lot less than it should do, really. Um, so it's more of an approach, a kind of mentality, I think, that's the, the issue, rather than the actual details of the systems themselves. Um, so yes, yes. And, and just before I move on to the second point I wanted to ask you about, do, do, I will be very quick. Um, do you think if we move towards a kind of almost a set of standards where um, contextualised admissions were, were looked at, that would help to, to do the almost, uh, that would move on to um, be, being better able to as assess how those factors are used? So if we had a set of standards, we would be better to assess how they were used? Well, um, I mean, that's difficult, I think, really. Um, I, think, I think university admissions and college admissions is always going to be a kind of complex business. Um, uh, and you're always going to take a range of factors into account. Um, I think we should try and shift the kind of balance towards greater transparency and away from sometimes what is sometimes a rather obscure process why decisions are taken. Um, uh, but I think I would, I, th I think you will never be able to achieve a kind of industrialized process where somehow, you know, you tick these boxes and it can be done by an, a computer algorithm, you know, who admit, I don't think university admission should ever be like that, really. Um, I think the individual has to come into it and, and, and personal decisions are important. Um, and that inevitably involves a degree of subjectivity. Um, but as I say, we should try and shift as much as possible towards transparency, greater transparency. 
and I'll be very brief with my second question, can we not? And it's in relation to um, students with, with disabilities. Um, because while it's mentioned in the report, there's not a huge degree of focus on, on young people with, with disabilities, particularly young people um, that are BSL. Um, and I'd be interested in your, your, your comment, because again, I, I heard from the Equalities and Human Rights Committee evidence that if a young person has a disability and they go through the application process, there is a disconnect between the application process and the process they go through to ensure that they have the funding and the support they need when they get to university, and it quite often prevents young people from going to the university that they want to go to. Um, and if I think particularly of our older universities, it may be more difficult for the older universities to provide the, both the, the physical and the emotional support that young people would need. So um, it, it, do you intend making some recommendations or progress in regards to that? Well, in my first annual report, I focused very much on the kind of the, the current issues, really, um, which to some degree have been set by the Commission's report itself and also by the response from the University of Scotland. So I addressed the same sort of list of things. Uh, but I did try and flag up other issues, um, which I'd like to come back to. And one was looking at other forms of disadvantage. And disability is a very important one. Um, uh, um, Disability itself, of course, comes in many different forms. I mean, you mentioned physical disability, um, and that raises a particular set of issues uh, which are often very concrete in terms of, uh, of, 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 of the provision that needs to be made. Uh, there are other forms, perhaps the most common form now, and a growing form, of course, is just dyslexia in some form or other. Um, now, uh, institutions which I think in the past were probably rather insensitive to that are now actually are much more sensitive to that and will make the kind of adjustments, and they're relatively easy adjustments to make, I think, in that case. Um, so each form of disability needs different remedies, um, uh, as different forms of social dis disadvantage probably need different remedies. Um, so again, it's a complex picture, but I mean, I would like to certainly come back to that, I mean, um, in, in my future annual report. Because it, it, it's interesting you picked up um, dys dyslexia, because dyslexia, is something that universities are, are, are quite willing to accommodate and, and assist. But it's young people that have perhaps a more profound disability um, are being prevented and they are being excluded. And it's an area I would like to see more progress being made in. Well, I mean, I, 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 mean, I would support that. I mean, I mean, obviously the issue of cost comes into it. I mean, and particularly if you have uh, uh, old buildings, um, making them accessible to people with physical disability can really be very expensive business as well. Um, while um, making the adjustments that are required for dyslexic students is probably much cheaper, uh, and obviously universities will consider that as well. Um, there's also, of course, a, a role for legislation. I mean, uh, it, many forms of disability are covered by legislation, and, and, and institutions, all organisations, are required to make uh, appropriate adjustments to meet the needs of disabled people. OK, thank you. Mm. Thank you, Kinsey. Thank you, Minute. George? Thank you, Convener. Good morning. One of the questions, this is a pretty simple question, but it's probably a minefield in itself. But the whole idea that uh, we we're talking about SMID uh, 20 and uh, for top disability, many people with disabilities will probably be in the SIMD 20 uh, category as well. Now, universities like in my own constituency in Paisley, UWS and Glasgow Cali are constantly getting the over the 20% mark. Well, it's not just the 20, they're not just ticking the box, they're getting over it, you know, and they have been doing for a number of years. Compared to that, to other more established universities, you know, why is, the question is quite simple, why is that? Why are they doing it and other universities seem to struggle? Well, um, I mean, there is, you're right to point out, there is quite a variable record uh, between different institutions. Um, but it, I think you have to take into account the degree of demand that a particular university has. Um, if you uh, are forced to be really quite selective in terms of the students you could admit, um, apparently making exceptions for students um, because they have certain social characteristics is probably more challenging than for a university that, where demand is more limited, where essentially they will admit all reasonably well-qualified students. Um, uh, so I think the challenge is, in a sense, harder for more selective institutions um, than, 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 than uh, institutions um, uh, like the ones you mentioned, uh, UWS and, and Caledonian. 
Um, having said that, I mean, there clearly are examples of institutions which are um, pretty selective, um, quite research intensive, which nevertheless have done rather well in terms of uh, meeting SIMD 20 targets. I mean, uh, it's probably rather invidious to mention them, but I mean, I think uh, Sterling, uh, Strathclyde, um, uh, Harriet Watt to some degree, um, um, Glasgow School of Art, which you wouldn't expect naturally to be that good at that. I mean, they've on the whole obviously uh, achieved well. There are other institutions which um, on the face of it, um, uh, there's a less clear reason why they haven't made so much progress. And I think probably uh, they need to be uh, challenged a bit more. Yeah, because in my time in the committee, the last term and this term, we seem to go around circles where certain universities will bring out, here is our young person from a disadvantaged background, whereas Glasgow, Cali and UWS are hitting the figures and doing it. But the, on that argument, there would be an argument made by, in most cases, post-92 institutions, that uh, the funding possibly support is maybe because these young people or people coming from uh, poorer backgrounds and maybe chaotic lifestyles, not so much on their side, but within their family. And we have all these other challenges that they are dealing with day in, day out. But after year one, where the kind of drop tends to happen, you know, that support that's still there. That, that, that lifestyle, everything that's involved is still there. And they would make an argument that for funding, that there should be some way that we look at possibly uh, supporting the institutions that are doing that. What would be your opinion on, on that scenario? Well, I think, in the fun, I, I think I'm right to say that in the past, the Funding Council did make some financial adjustments. Um, uh, uh, it's a difficult issue, that, really. Um, uh, um, it could be seen, I suppose, from the perspective of an ancient university that they are somehow being penalised um, because their students don't have such chaotic lifestyles. Um, but I agree, we should take into account the extra costs that are sometimes involved in, in the support of those kind of students. Um, I think that needs to be addressed, though, in a twin-track way, through institutional funding, but also in, in, in financial support for the, the students themselves. Uh, and I know the Scottish Government, of course, uh, did commission a report uh, which was published on on student uh, finance uh, last November, I think, and I, I think a, a response from the government to that report will presumably be forthcoming fairly soon, and um, and that's an issue I'd like to come back to, I think, really, yes. Um, generally, though, I think the, the, um, the approach has always been, not just in Scotland, but across the UK, um, that, that, in a way, funding for teaching students should be relatively formulaic it should uh, take into account the cost of the teaching for that subject. So you could get more for medicine than for history. Uh, but apart from that, you shouldn't take into account different characteristics of the student body. I mean, of course, you could uh, make the counter argument that you should take into account the, uh, the kind of students you recruit. And if they are more expensive to teach because of some of the reasons you mentioned, um, that should be reflected in, in a kind of premium for the institution itself. Just finally, could there also be a situation where, you know, someone might be academically uh, have the ability to go to one of the ancients, but necessarily not apply because of their own background and call it inverted snobbery or whatever else, you know, might find a situation where they are more comfortable in certain kind of institutions. Would that not be down to the actual recruitment and uh, uh, maybe something simple, not so much all pounds, shillings and pence, but actually, you know, how we're going about recruiting young people at certain institutions? Hmm. Um, well, that again is a very difficult issue. I mean, take, take the University of St Andrews. I mean, uh, it's very proud that it was established in 1413 and makes a lot of that. Um, uh, on certain occasions, their students parade around in red gowns. Um, this is probably not the image that some people necessarily want to kind of be associated with. I mean, it, it's a, um, quite a strong cultural message that's being sent there. Um, so I think a university like that, that of course prides itself on its traditions, does need to take into account the fact that that might act as a kind of bit of a put off for certain kinds of applicants. And they need to work a bit harder to prove to those kind of people that no, they would fit in and they would be welcome there. Um, uh, that's difficult, I mean. Yeah. Okay. George Ross. I'd like to look at the wider issues that affect mm. access. We're all 
very well aware that rising public transport costs, issues with the private rental sector can affect retention in particular, going back to, to Ruth Maguire's point. How able have you felt, Professor Scott, to address these wider issues that fall out with education portfolios? Well, um, I, I think I, there have to be some limits to kind of my remit. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right to say uh, that people's lives are not self-contained um, uh, and issues of public transport are really crucial, I think. I mean, in terms of how easy it is to get to university or college um, and what it costs you has a big impact on whether you're going to go there in the first place or whether you can, can afford to stay there. Um, uh, but I'm not quite sure what boundaries um, could be set, because there are so many other factors that would ta be taken, and health is obviously an issue as well. I don't think on the whole I should find myself trying to feel obliged to comment on issues of public transport costs or health policy in Scotland as well. I think my role would then become too diffuse. I, I think you're probably right in that regard. How, how do you feel the government should take a, a holistic approach to this, though? Because obviously tremendous progress can be made in the work that you're doing and following through on the recommendations from the Commission. But I think it was yourself used the word holistic uh, beforehand. Unless a holistic approach is, is taken to this, we won't reach the, the targets that we really want to see. How should that holistic approach be taken forward because it's as you said it's not just for yourself and, and what you're doing but this affects a range of government departments of agencies public policy areas far out with what your remit could possibly reach but there needs to be some level of of connection there yes um well i think the way that this role of, of commissioner was conceived um that holistic in my terms means the education system um now, I agree, um, you know, there are no firm boundaries to the education system, um, but I'm very aware uh, that to focus too much on colleges and universities, and particularly on traditional universities, would, you would miss the bigger picture. Um, and it's really important to understand what's going on in schools and what the issues are there. Um, and that's one of my priorities in, in the current year, to focus more on issues in schools. Um, if you look at many of the outreach initiatives taken by universities. Some really try and address uh, students at really quite a young age, I mean, in primary school, um, and try and involve their parents at that stage. Um, uh, and on the whole, I think the evidence, such as it exists, shows that that's pretty effective on the whole, because it familiarises people with the idea of going to university as not being a strange experience after all. Um, so I certainly think it's important to look look holistically across the whole of education, um, uh, inevitably that will bring in some aspects of social care, I suppose, as well. But again, I have to set some limits, otherwise I will be ending up commenting on why societies are unequal. And although I have personal views about that, <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure they're relevant in this context. I think we, we could have an exception, and this committee will be having an exceptionally long discussion about that at some point. Um, on the, you make an interesting point around schools, it's been discussed a little bit already, um, universities that have that outreach from, from an early age, see success from that. From what you've seen so far, does that require a certain level of buy-in at a local authority level? Does it vary from local authority to local authority? Or is this something that's happening with individual schools, universities and individual head teachers essentially showing the initiative? No, I think uh, local authorities are very important. Um, and local authorities obviously are very important in terms of raising school attainment levels. I mean, um, I'm very struck by the success of schools in Glasgow uh, in terms of raising educational attainment levels. And inevitably, that has a knock-on effect in making the fair access easier for the universities based there. I mean, interesting enough, in the UK, if you look at London, exactly the same has happened in London. Um, school levels, attainment levels have increased substantially. Uh, so I think you do need to look at these local variations and look at the role of local education authorities and find out why, in certain areas, school attainment levels seem to have been increased substantially through concerted efforts. In other areas, there has been less success um, because that clearly sets the platform on which then fair access to higher education is built. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Over. And then, Julie. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. I'm, I sort of follow on a little bit from uh, Ross Greer's questions on transport and housing and things like that um, in the sense that I think there 
there is a role for you to take in terms of student support. And I'm just interested um, in your, your thoughts and, and reflections on that, particularly in relation to how student finance impacts upon uh, the, the access targets and, and people's desire to, to, to undertake studies. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that these matters are unimportant. Um, uh, and I referred to the review of student financial support, um, the report that was published uh, last November. Um, now, that focused very much on direct financial support to students in terms of loans or, or grants and so on. And that's an important matter. But other things like the availability of housing and transport are crucial as well. Um, uh, universities clearly invest a lot in, in, in student accommodation, um, but a lot of it, of course, is addressed to the needs of young adult students, 18 to 21, 22 year olds. I mean, that's, that's what's in mind, although increasingly, of course, they bear in mind the conference business as well when they build uh, accommodation. Um, uh, and if you're uh, uh, commuting from home, um, the availability of housing is not important, but the availability of transport is very important. So different groups of students have a different balance of needs, really, um, and it does my, make a complex picture. My point was really that if you've got the right financial support package in place, some of the issues around housing and transport become that bit easier. And it was really your thoughts in terms of the review and in terms of, you know, in, in terms of how important that, that student support was to ensuring that people from uh, from from, from uh, the targeted backgrounds that actually want to and feel able to go to university. Um, yes, I mean I, I think finance is, is crucial. I mean the discussions I've had with students, they've always mentioned money. I mean in a way that's not surprising, um, but clearly that's always at the forefront of people's minds. Um, uh, and I think uh, financial stress is often a significant factor in in dropout or lack of success by students uh, and clearly the perception that this might be expensive and you don't know where the money will come from to pay for it will discourage people from applying in the first place uh, so finance is important um, um, i deliberately didn't say very much in my annual report because i there had been a, a separate report on this uh, and uh, it was published only a few weeks before my annual report, um, and the government hadn't responded and still hasn't responded directly on that. Um, so I think it's right for me probably to wait to see what kind of response the government makes. Um, if I could make a general observation, though, I mean, one of the complaints often made is that poorer students end up, uh, when they graduate, with higher levels of debt than students from more advantaged backgrounds. Um, and I think with any loans-based system, that is almost inevitable. Exactly the same happens in England. Uh, it happens in all countries where you have a loans-based system of student support. The only way that you could address that would be to have a very generous support of student grants, as I benefited from when I was a student. Uh, but that's a very expensive business, um, and governments have uh, competing priorities. Um, but I think these are the issues that probably I would like to come back to when I see what response the government makes to the specific recommendations made in the student uh, support review. Uh, finally, Julian. I want to come back to the uh, to, to the things that you've been mentioning about um, certain universities not recognising higher national qualifications. And as a former college lecturer, um, this is something that I have spent a lot of my, my life uh, complaining about. Um, and also the the fact that some colleges are not doing any kind of like access to type programmes or bridging programmes or outreach, as has been mentioned before. And you make some recommendations about the SFC's role in this. How do you see, I mean, you're, you're, you're making recommendations, but I'm sensing that you want the SFC to take a role in actually identifying the, the universities that are not maybe making the inroads that others are and saying this is not acceptable. You know, do you feel that they've got the heft to be able to do that? Well, I mean, that's why I made the recommendation. I think our starting point should always be as the default position that an HND is a two-year full-time higher education qualification. If you transfer to a degree program, it should be into year three. Now, I know that won't always be possible. You might have changed subject. Um, uh, the approach, um, 
within the HN might be different from the approach taken in the degree program. Um, but I don't think we should start with all the difficulties. And I sometimes think these discussions say, oh, it's all very, very difficult. Um, and I think we should start from the other end and saying, this should be possible. Uh, if there are difficulties, let's discuss them, uh, see how valid they are, and if they are valid, how do we address them? Now, I think there are good examples of, of, uh, of, of universities and colleges working together um, across HNs and degrees to make sure there's a better compatibility of, of, of approaches and content and so on. Um, uh, um, so I think there's good practice out there. Um, it's just a question of generalizing it uh, and perhaps, perhaps adopting a slightly more positive approach rather than, oh, it's all very difficult. Is that, cause I, I don't think it's difficult, and I think there's evidence there in the, the universities and the colleges that are working together that the success of college students with a higher national actually do quite well at, at university. Um, so there, that, I reckon that evidence is there, but why are some universities not recognising that evidence? What's the sticking point? What are their arguments against it? I I, I think the issue is it's often subject-based. I think in, in, in areas like engineering and to some extent business studies and management, I think there's, there's a, a better understanding of how HNs and degrees fit together, um, while in other areas um, it's more difficult. And obviously there are other areas in which there isn't an HN equivalent. I mean, um, so someone would be changing subject entirely if they came to university. Um, to study a new, a new area. Um, uh, partly it's to do with the tradition of the institution. I mean, some universities, for instance, I mean, Strathclyde and Harriet Watt come from, uh, from a kind of higher technical education history. That's their history, really, uh, professional education. Uh, therefore, their links and understanding what goes on in the colleges is probably naturally rather better than it would be in the case of St Andrews, um, which doesn't have that kind of history. Um, so I think there are lots of explanations, um, uh, but I think it's not enough just to look to history and say, well, we can understand why people, more people in this institution understand HNs well than in that institution. I think we have to find remedies for it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, then. Uh, and in that case, uh, um, thank you for your attendance. And that was a very useful session. And it brings us to the end of the public part in the meeting. So can I suspend the meeting while we wait for the public gallery to clear? Thank you very much.